and, and get the answer. So left, left, right is 0.12 times 0.12 times 0.88, and then we'll multiply that by 3. 0.12 oops, times 0.12 times 0.88, so 0 0.12672. times 3. Oops, I forgot 0. Sorry. Point zero one two six seven two times 3. And we get point zero three eight zero one six, which is what we had before. So this tells me my other probabilities were correct because I matched the complement rule. So the distribution tells me that if I randomly sample three, uh, it just says people, so three people from the US population, there's a 68% chance that none of them will be left-handed there's about a 28% chance that one will be left-handed. Could be the first, second, or third person. There's about a 4% chance that two of them will be left-handed. And there's less than a 1% chance that all three will be left-handed. And again, all of the probabilities add up to one. So it's a valid probability distribution. So this is the process basically for this, this chapter. What we're doing is we're counting something. Um, the number of heads, the number of consonants, the number of left-handed people, out of some number of trials basically. So then what we want to know is, well what are the different values I could see and what are the probabilities associated with them built into all of these calculations are all of the rules we were talking about before. We're still using the multiplication rule. We're still using the general addition rule. We're actually still even using conditional probabilities. But in these previous two examples we haven't had to worry about the conditional two, the conditional probabilities. Okay. Because to really to find say this probability left, right, right. What we're saying is we want the probability of left and right and right so that's a longer version of the multiplication rule. So it would say what's the probability that you get a left-handed person times what's the probability you get a right-handed person given first was left but since our people are assumed to be independent we don't care. It goes away. And then the third one is saying, what's the probability that you get a right-handed person given the first was left and the second was right? Well, again, these, the people are independent, so we don't care. The conditional probabilities go away. So all of the rules are still built in here. We're just not explicitly using them. So here, um, this goes back to the first page when we were computing the average payout. So we could think of it as what are all of the different payouts we could see. So think of all the different numbers. And what we found was that was the same as taking each little x multiplied by its probability and adding them all up. So there's a formula here, don't worry too much about the formula. This symbol here, I don't know if we've seen it before, is the Greek letter mu, and that's just the, the, the symbol for mean, the symbol for an average. So we have this new way of computing an average, but as we'll see in this example, it's the same as the old way, it's just a shorthand version. So what this formula says is take each little x multiplied by its probability so it's this piece 
and then this weird E shape is actually a capital Greek S, which stands for sum. So this says add up all of these products, and that gives you the average. So let's do an example of this. So here's our population. We'll keep it simple. It's just 10 numbers. So the population is three twos, two fours, one five, and four sixes. So we're measuring something. This is, these are all of the measurements we care about. And what we're interested in is what's the average value we would see from the population. So the old way of finding the average would be let's add all of these up and divide by 10. So if you do that, what you end up with is 43 divided by 10 or 4.3. So now what we can do is we can sort of work backwards. We can split this up into equivalent forms. So let's first split it by, by digit. So first we would have the twos divided by 10. So we're just splitting up the fraction into multiple pieces. Plus the fours. plus the one five plus the four sixes and we can um, simplify each of these fractions a little bit further two plus two plus two well that's the same as three times two so we have three times two t over ten um, actually, let's let's write it set a different way. It all works out the same. Plus, we have two fours. Plus, we have one five. Plus, we have four sixes. These two lines are still the same. Uh, if the 2 is out front, it, it doesn't really matter. You can imagine that it's over a 1, so 2 times 3 over 1 times 10 is still 6 over 10, which is still 2 plus 2 plus 2 over 10. So from this point, the math hasn't changed. This still works out to be 4.3, but now that it's in this form, this looks like what we, what we would get from a probability distribution. So if we drew the probability distribution, the little x is the values that we could observe in the population. So 2, 4, 5, and 6. And what we were told is we had 3 of the 10 values would be a 2, 2 of the 10 would be a 4, 1 of the 10 would be a 5, 4 of the 10 would be a 6, and those all add up to 1. So what this new equation for the mean is saying is it says take each value, multiply it by its probability, and then add them all up. And this is what we did here. So 2 times 3 tenths plus the next one, 4 times two tenths plus the next one five times one tenth plus six times four tenths that math gives you 4.3 and either way you read this these steps as you start expanding out what two times three over ten is that means that you have three twos two fours one five four sixes they're all over the same denominator so you can combine them all together 
and then you're back to the old way of computing an average. So it's two different ways of getting to the same spot, but the new formula just takes advantage of the, the shape of the table. Take each x times its probability, add them all up, and that's the new way of finding an average. Um, so I like this example a lot. It's, it's not as interesting to do in this electronic lecture format. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll post a spreadsheet on Canvas that, that does the math here. These numbers are really big and it's a real pain in the butt to do this by hand. So I'll set up what's happening in the problem, um, but I'll, I'll post that spreadsheet and then we'll go over it on Thursday. Uh, and it'll be hopefully clearer then. So what this example is about is what, what we can use a probability distribution for and an average from a prob probability distribution is to learn about lottery tickets, whether or not we're going to make money, basically, which is, I think, why people buy lottery tickets. You want to make money. So this example is about the Powerball. So what the Powerball tells you is on their website, they give you basically a probability distribution. They tell you how much money you could win and the probability that you win that amount of money. But, as we'll see, there's something missing here. The leftmost column, that's what uh, has to happen with your numbers. So I can't remember how many red digits there are, how many white digits there are. I think the red goes 1, one through 39, and the whites are 1 through 69, I think. I'll have to check that. But these are telling you what matches you have to have, and these are your prizes. So if you match just the red ball, you win four bucks. And that happens one out of 38.32 times. Um, to, buy a, to buy a ticket, it costs two bucks. So you have a chance to double your money, basically. The grand prize is pretty slim, one out of a little more than 292 million. So as of the other day, that grand prize was 348 million dollars. So what we want to know is, what's our expected return on this two dollar ticket? Or in other words, on average, how much money will we win per ticket? So we can answer the question of, should we use our retirement safe savings to buy Powerball tickets? Probably not. So. Within this table, they're telling you all the amounts you could win. They tell you the overall chance of winning something. Anything from $4 up to the grand prize. The chance of winning one of those is 1 in 24.87. So this is almost a valid probability distribution. If you add up all these numbers, what you'll find is they don't add up to 1. There's an outcome missing here. What they're not telling you is that if you match nothing, your prize is zero dollars. So they're not telling you how often you'll lose. But what they do tell you is how often you'll win. So the odds of losing we can do that via the complement rule. One minus the probability that you win something. So one minus one out of 24.87 works out to be uh, 
I don't I don't need to use a, a decimal actually. So it's going to be 24.87 minus 1, 23.87. Out of 24.87. So that's the chance that you win nothing. You just lose your two bucks. Well, that's not very informative. Divide that by 24.87. Turn it into a percent. So that the the probability that you oops the probability that you win nothing that you lose on your ticket is almost 96 percent. So any ticket you buy has a, about a 96 percent chance to give you nothing, nothing at all. So 95.98 percent. So what this is telling you is on the flip side, anytime you buy a ticket, there's only a 4 percent chance to win something. And if you do win, you probably just won four bucks.